pairs of opposed faults or conjugate faults can yield important information about the stress regime in which they formed if we apply Anderson's theory. So let's see how this works. So here we have a representation of a pair of faults, a yellow fault and a purple fault, and they're a conjugate system forming an angular relationship between each other. If we apply Anderson's theory, the maximum compressive stress would have been oriented like this, in other words, bisecting this acute angle through here. So that is the axis of the maximum compressive stress. This is the axis of the minimum compressive stress, and they are orthogonal to one another. And running down the intersection through here is the intermediate comp uh, compressive stress. So we have three orthogonal axes for the principal compressive stresses. There's sigma 2, there's sigma 1, there's sigma 3. So how does these work? Well, I'm just going to look at the sigma 1, sigma 3 relationship and just pop that on here to represent that system. Maximum compressive stress here, minimum compressive stress here. And you can see that they are orthogonal. And sigma 2, the intermediate compressive stress, runs down through here, straight down the diagram. And you can see that they are mutually orthogonal. So the plane, represented by this green surface, that contains sigma 1 and sigma 3, has as its pole the sigma 2 orientation. So this is a mutually orthogonal system, and we can use it uh, to plot the relationships between some compressive stresses if we know the orientation of the fault planes. Relationships. So let's plot these relationships on your stereo net using the orientation of two faults that we've measured uh, in the field. And these are the orientations of the faults that we'll use, and we'll plot these now in turn. So let's plot the north arrow onto our net so we know where we are. And we can plot the first fault now, which is 040, 10, 20, 30, 40. So that's a strike of 040. Spin it around and measure the, or plot the great circle that has a dip of 70 degrees. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. And it's this great circle here. So we can tie this back up to the strike on the edge of the stereo net, like this. So that's our fault number one, which was 04070 towards the southeast. So now I'll plot the other fault, which was 350 as a strike. Oops, that slipped off north. Let's put that back. 350. There is the strike, and the dip was towards the west, which is over on this side, and it's a dip of 60 degrees, so let's count in 60. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 is that great circle there. So our faults have crossed at that point. Let's just complete the great circle. So there we have the two fault planes plotted on the stereo net. Let's just write down the orientation of the fault plane, which was 3, 50, 60, dip, west. So there are the faults and their orientations on the net. And we can find here the intersection between the two fault planes. Clearly on the net, it's here. So that is the orientation of sigma 2. So let's just report sigma 2 as a plunge in a plunge direction. So let's spin the sigma 2 axis around so that it sits on a vertical great circle. The strike of that vertical great circle here will be the plunge direction, which we'll read off in a minute, but let's get the plunge. That's 10, 20, 30, 42 degrees. So the plunge is 42. Let's run, spin that round to here, read off the direction. 
180, 190, 202. So that's 42 towards a bearing 202, and that is the sigma 2 axis. So when we visualized our conjugate faults uh, just now, we saw that the sigma 2 axis was the pole to the plane that contained sigma 1 and sigma 3. So if sigma 2 is here, well actually going down like this, the plane that contains uh, sigma 1 and sigma 3 is going to arch off in this position somewhere over here on the stereo net. So let's just plot that. So let's spin sigma 2 around so it sits here opposite the tracing circles and we said that the plunge of uh, sigma 2 is 42 so the great circle that that's the pole to will have a dip over here 10, 20, 30, 42 here. So that becomes 90 degrees across the stereo net. Let's just trace this on. So this that we're drawing on here, this great circle, is the plane that will contain both sigma 1 and sigma 3. So the plane whose pole is sigma 2. So to measure the angle between the two fault planes, we measure it in the profile plane in here, and the bisector of the angle between the two fault planes will be somewhere in this position, halfway between this intersection and this intersection. And then we can see whether this is an acute or open angle. Well, let's just count this up. That coming in from here, that's intersects there. That's eight degrees, 18, 28, 38, 48, 58, 68, 70. So that's 70 degrees in there. Okay, so I'll just label that as 70 degrees. So we know what the distance is around that great circle. So now let's bisect this angle. In other words, divide by two, that's 35. So let's count around 35. So that's 30, that's two, 32, 34, 35 puts that there and we'll just use um, a blue here to represent that axis which I put in the wrong place it's there so that is the axis that bisects this angle important to get these checks in so we'll ignore that one for now well avoiding the glitch this angle in here bisects 70 degrees. So 70 degrees is an acute angle. So that point there is sigma 1. Let's spin the net round and read off the orientation that that makes. So get it round onto a vertical great circle. Here's our vertical great circle. It, the vertical great circle intersects the edge of the stereo net there. So that's the plunge direction for sigma 1. While we're here, let's just count in 10, 20, Sorry, 10, 20, 30, 40, 48 degrees is the plunge amount, and it is towards a bearing there of 010, and that is sigma 1. So now let's finally find sigma 3. So we get our profile, the brown great circle, which contains sigma 1 and sigma 3. Sigma 1 and sigma 3 must be at 90 degrees to one another. So let's just count around. That's 8. So it's only 8 degrees back to this one in here. So in other words, it's 8 degrees up from the edge of the stereo net. That is the position of sigma 3, where this distance here is 90 degrees. From here around to there, around the great circle that contains the axes of sigma 1 and sigma 3. So let's just read off the plunge and plunge direction for sigma 3. Put it onto its vertical great circle coming through here. That's the axis of sigma 3 and the plunge direction. And that's the plunge amount. Just that few degrees in there looks like it's about 6 degrees. 06, spin it around like this so that we can read off that bearing. That's 90, 100, 
108. So let's write this upside the right way up. 106 to 108 is sigma 3, plunging 6 degrees to a bearing 108. Just get that out of the way. So here we've got the three axes of the principal stresses on the stereonet and reported in three-dimensional space with a plunged amount and a plunge direction in each case. And we can see that sigma 1, the maximum compressive stress direction, is plunging down like this towards the north approximately and about halfway in from the edge of the stereonet to the pin. So that's a plunge going down like that uh, into, the, uh, into the net. We said that at a plunge of 48 degrees. So we're looking at a system in here of oblique normal faulting. It would be perfect normal faulting if sigma 1 was vertical, but it's, not, it's off vertical, it's about halfway to the edge. So these are oblique slip normal faults. So these analyses by plotting conjugate faults on a stereonet is a quick way of finding the orientations of the axes of the principal stresses. And it's a really useful visualization tool. Much easier than messing around with pieces of cardboard.